Hi everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and I finished up today the second book in the Q Continuum Saga. This was Q Zone, which was quite a bit different from the initial uh, Q Space, the the first book. But it uh, it went off in a completely different direction from the first one, and I loved it. I loved it a lot. Uh, so. Before we uh, get too far into it, let's talk about the cover, because I actually don't really even know who we're looking at here. So, uh, still the uh, cover artist is the same Drew Blair as the last one, but you can see we've got our Captain Picard here, and then I think this is the female Q over here on the left, and then this other person here on the other side... I think maybe the villainous zero. So, anyway, I like the cover. Very cool cover. Uh, the mystery of Q's past unfolds in this book, which uh, not entirely true, but it does give you a, a glimpse, a, a bit of a glimpse into Q's past here. So, uh, let's read the back here. So, the puckish super being called Q has bedeviled Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the Starship Enterprise since their first encounter at Farpoint Station. But little was known of Q's enigmatic past or that of the transcendent plane where he sometimes dwells. Now Picard must discover Q's secrets for the sake of all that exists. While the Enterprise struggles to survive an alien onslaught, Captain Picard has been kidnapped by Q and taken on an astounding journey back through time to that immeasurably distant moment when the Continuum faced its greatest threat. But far more is at stake than simply the mysteries of the past, for an ancient menace is stirring once more, endangering the future of the galaxy, and neither Q nor Starfleet will be able to stop it. Cool. Alright, yeah, the back cover gives you no indication at all of what this book really is, which is pretty interesting, because... Just before I get too crazy into it, we'll just kind of cover uh, the, the basics of it. So, again, this this picks up where the last Q Continuum book left off, with the Enterprise E being kind of assaulted and surrounded by the Calamarain, this gaseous life form that's basically hates Q and is trying to get Q. And uh, Captain Picard has been taken away by Q, and initially was shown kind of like this this series of uh, Q's past events, Q's past life. That, that was what happened in Q space. And now in Q's zone, uh, they really kick it up a notch. So the book mainly centers on O and his henchmen that he brings in in the book. And then their test of the Takan Empire. So that was a fun, unexpected surprise. The Takan Empire has popped up in, um, you know, in Star Trek in the past, and just recently in that Star Trek Resurgence game, uh, that was a big part of it as well. So the Takan are brought up here, and here's where you get to learn, learn about the downfall of the Takan and what happened, and basically how it was all affected by Zero and these entities and this whole, you know this whole test that they were putting on. so, And then this whole thing is kind of... You can obviously see it's kind of like the backdrop to the threat that they have been leading on throughout the first book and this book as well. Whatever is stuck beyond the Great Barrier, uh, you know, it's all kind of coming together now here in this. So, uh, But yeah, it was... Uh, an interesting book. It was a departure from the first one. Uh, you get very little action on the Enterprise, and even very little interaction between like Q and Picard, like you get in the last one. And it's just more of kind of telling the story of this Empire and their their downfall and how it was kind of pushed. You know, it was kind of pushed to be pushed in that direction by uh, Zero in the guise of this kind of test that they were doing. So uh, just a very interesting and a very I don't know, a very dark kind of story even because it just 
obviously everything that they are doing, bringing upon these people is going to be a negative thing, you know? So, uh, and it's not a self-contained thing really in itself, I guess, because it's more of a to be continued. I mean, it's part two of three, so you had to kind of know that going in. And it leaves me kind of thinking that the third book in the trilogy here, Hugh Strike, has got to be absolutely jammed packed full of stuff because it seems like there's an awful lot that uh, Greg Cox, the author, has to resolve in this final book. So, yeah, but this has been, uh, this has been very fun, and uh, I'm really enjoying this whole Q saga and just kind of learning more about Q and getting into his past. So it's been a fun, a fun read for sure, and we'll be diving right into the next one right after this. So uh, if you don't want to be spoiled, you can go ahead and stop there, and as always, live long and prosper. But now we're going to go ahead and just actually rant and rave about the book for a little bit because that's what we like to do here on this channel. So, again, the book surprised me because uh, it starts out kind of like how the last one did. You have your little prologue talking where you have this nameless entity who's getting closer. He's sensing Q. He's sensing something. And we're kind of uh, led to know right now or we kind of know right now that this entity is obviously related to Zero somehow. So, uh, Oh, so the book starts off with a first officer's log, like the other one started off with a captain's log. So uh, good on him for keeping that up. It's, it's always a good way to start a Star Trek book. So uh, things are getting worse on the Enterprise E, being accosted by these Calamaranes. Uh, basically at this point now, uh, gravity has went out, so everybody has to wear uh, magnetic boots to get around. Barkley is struggling. He, he has trouble with the zero Gs. Uh, but the main story is not what is happening on the Enterprise. It is Q showing Picard basically Zero's story. Zero and young Q. And it starts off with Zero, his first basically test is going to be against these Calamarain you know, in the past, in the past. So, and this is what sets them off on cue. But basically, the Calamarain are uh, like a gaseous life form. So in the past, Zero and Q infiltrate them, and then Zero tries to control them, basically to use them almost as his own kind of vehicle to move about space. Uh, when the Calamarain break out of that, he's enraged, and he kind of shows his true nature at that point, and he constricts and contracts them and freezes them and, like, throws them off into deep space for, like, a millennium. And, and that's, like, the, the whole source of the Calamarain's animosity towards Q and, and Zero as well. So, but even after seeing that, well, once seeing that, Q kind of realizes that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be thrown in with this guy. But he's still kind of convinced by his talk, and they decide that they need to find another species that they can test. Uh, and this is when O decides that he needs to bring in some of his buddies from his other plane of existence or wherever he was at. So, so here's where you meet three very interesting characters that they bring in. Uh, the first one is called... Gorgon. And oh, they uh, basically what they do is they go back to the Guardian of Forever, where O speaks in some sort of strange language that not even Q understands, and then summons these three beings. The first one being Gorgon, who is kind of represented as, uh, well, pictured as like an angel. He has a, I wrote it down here, silver hair, an amethyst robe, and a sea green aura about him. And Gorgon, like a humanoid figure. And then the next one that he brings out, not at all humanoid, basically a crimson sphere of kind of spinning light who is um, named only as an Asterix. So we'll just call him Asterix. Uh, Asterix comes out next. And uh, after that, uh, the last one that they bring out, and Q's getting a little nervous at this point. He's like, I took responsibility for you to be here. But now we've got all these other ones coming out. I don't know about this. But O, again, kind of talk Zero talks again, you know, 
talks him down. And then he brings out the last one called the One, who comes out as first as like a flaming pillar, pillar of fire, and then turns into like a kind of like a Moses-like figure. And then it's kind of explained that they are each kind of like the masters of this own, I don't know, form of chaos or evil. I don't. I guess that, that it would be. So uh, the Q, de, Q, young Q, picks the Takan Empire as a worthy species of being tested. The Takan are already at this point super, super advanced, uh, worthy of Q's kind of admiration and notice even at this point in his, in his life. So they are the ones that they set about to test. And they send Gorgon, Asterix, and the One to the, the people to test them. So, And that's when you kind of get into what the, the meat of this book really is. They introduce you to the Empress of Takan, uh, Glevi Utsov. And it starts off when she's young and just like in the second year of her, her reign. And even then... Uh, they start to kind of show that she she senses something amiss, that there's something going on within her empire. So, uh, and they really, like, the fun and exciting and surprising part about this book is how much they get into just talking about the Takan and their, how advanced they were. But basically what was going on with their system was their star was nearing its end. So their advanced engineers had come up with a way to actually transport their dying star away and transport a young star to them. So yeah, what they called the Great Endeavor. And the Great Endeavor was something that was going to take you know generations and generations to complete, obviously. But if they didn't do it, they would lose all of the inner worlds, you know, the original Takan homeworld and all that. Of course, at this time, the Empire has grown and is quite large, and there's there's worlds well out beyond that. And this is where they begin to kind of sow dissent. So they do... Oh, uh, one of the other fun things about how they... or how Greg Cox writes this is he shows or he describes Q and O as being kind of like these massively large figures on this grand galactic scale where, you know, they're just taking these strides from one galaxy to another as they're doing these, you know, and influencing these events. And it's just, that is very well done. And I, I thought, like, that was really cool. And just a, I don't know, a good way to kind of look at, look at these beings, you know, and, and how they interact and interfere with a regular life, so... I think that was well done. Uh, so basically what they do is they set, up, set about sowing chaos. Uh, the first bit they show you is Gorgon, and Gorgon is on one of the outer worlds, and there is currently like a debate going on between the younger crowd and the older crowd about sending their resources off to fund the Great Endeavor. So Gorgon becomes kind of like the the devil or the angel on your shoulder, you know, whispering to this young man, telling him what to say, telling him what to do to kind of rile up the crowd. And then when this young man is like, you know, met with opposition in the form of this older woman, and then he whispers to this older woman on her shoulder, you know, just give up, you know, you've already lost and kind of pushing her down and kind of tipping the scales in one direction. So he basically incites a riot against the Empress, kind of the first action against the Empress, and also directly interferes, too, uh, by... See, these people are so advanced, their technology is so advanced, the security forces of Takan basically just have rings on their fingers, and they, they just kind of, like, point at people, and they're instantly zapped into jail. Like that's how that's how it's taken care of. So he directly interferes and shuts off their equipment so that they can't shut down the riot, you know. And the riot advances, and then they basically time skip ahead. They they do. I think that was twenty years into her reign. Then they do fifty years into her reign, and now they give you this really big space battle between the now you know twenty year long kind of civil war that's been going on between the outer worlds and the inner worlds. And here you have 
Asterix influencing his events as well by uh, basically his goal is to keep the fighting going on as long as possible and he does that by influencing the battle even so much as like bringing people back to life and back to life and back to life just to keep the fight going on and on and on and all this time he's like absorbing all of the hate and the anger and all of that and kind of feeding on all that and that's what his deal is so and basically uh the the third one the one uh keeps on inciting ridiculous poorly timed natural disasters and things like that just to kind of keep keeping them down and keep pushing them down and it's fun it's well it's interesting the the queen by the i think this we get to the 80th year of her reign or whatever she has this dream, and she finally realizes. So, Q initially kind of talks about how the Takan are like maybe almost there, almost ready to kind of hit that next level of consciousness. And I think they kind of show that here too, with the Queen, where she's able to see that they are being manipulated. So she is able to see, kind of piece together all these little events that have happened throughout the past eighty years of her reign that are just ridiculous and, and just couldn't be you know exactly true so she does that she pieces all that together and is able to also she's able to remember her dream which was a very interesting dream where uh, she sees basically the the Tacanian Empire as this bull and it's being prodded and poked by these three uh, three black figures you know prodded and poked and in the background she sees these two figures watching and then finally one of the figures comes up in her dream with a big sword and cuts the head off the bull while the other figure in the background tries to stop him and can't make it in time. So she sees this, she has this dream and she kind of comes to realize what's going on and then she has an announcement and she has this announcement that she announces to all of her people even to the planets that are rebelling against her, you know. And she kind of entreats everybody, look at what's been going on, everything that's happened all this time. Obviously, there's an outside influence affecting us. And she nails it. She's like, we're being tested by some kind of greater entity. And Q, young Q, is very excited for her. He's like, well, look at that. They passed the test. They figured it out. And they're able to stop the violence long enough so that they can complete the great endeavor, which is in itself a crazy feat of engineering because they've basically built these giant latticework structures over two stars so they can transport the bad one out and transport the good one in. So just the, the, the engineering feat to be able to build a structure around a star, you know, that's crazy. Dyson Sphere, that's coming up. Uh, but yeah. So... They did it, and they're able to stop the fighting, and Q's happy. Oh, Zero is not happy, however. This is not how Zero wanted things to turn out. Zero wanted this to end with destruction, and he decides that he is going to go ahead and just make sure that it does end in destruction. Uh, Q tries to stop him, but at this point he's called back Gorgon and the One and Asterix, and they hold back young Q while... Zero basically reaches into the Taconian star, <clears throat> twists it around a little bit, messes with the elements, and ignites it right away. And so instead of them transporting the star away, it blows up and takes out the whole Taconian Empire with it. Um, young Q is aghast, of course. Uh, can't believe that they've done this. And then this is when he kind of looks at Zero and he realizes what he really is. And he asks Zero, how many people have survived one of your tests before? How many, you know, how many people have actually survived? And Zero looks at him and gives him this look and he realizes that none of them have. He just kills them all. So, and that's basically how the book ends right there. But I've just given you there the the Q side of things. Excuse me. The, which was actually, that was the, the biggest and the largest portion of the book itself anyway. 
I didn't take the greatest notes this week, I will be honest with you. They started out okay, and then basically I finished the book today and finished up like, you know, three-fourths of the notes right there as well. But I think it turned out fine in the end anyway, so I'm not, not worried about that. Um, the story on the Enterprise, it's maybe 20% of this. The rest of it is all the Takan stuff. But basically what you get is Rikers in command. Everything is just getting worse by the minute. And they have to make a decision on what to do. Now, Barkley, in the last book, has discovered that one of the probes they sent towards the barrier in its bioneural gel packs actually absorbed some of the energy. So, you know, he's a smart guy. So he comes to... Mosquito. There's a mosquito in here. Watch out for that guy. Barkley's a smart guy. He comes to think maybe we could use that somehow. So he tries to figure out a way to report that to uh, report that to LaForge, but then he gets sidetracked having to take care of this um, Betazoid scientist, Lem Fall, who in the first book is the one that wants to penetrate this barrier and is basically obsessed with getting through it. And he's, he's not in this one very much at all, but kind of plays a, a big part in the end, which you can tell is going to lead up to whatever's going on in the last Q strike, you know, so. But anyway, uh, this Lem Fall, he's like insistent that Riker stop battling the Calamarain and continue the experiment. And basically the guy is like obsessed. He doesn't realize that, I mean, it's not like they can just bust out and go do the experiment. They're stuck. They're in trouble. But he doesn't get that and he's kind of one-sided as far as just wanting to do his experiment. And he's got two kids too that are on board the ship and he pays them no attention whatsoever. And that's kind of like part of it too. Uh, one of his kids is like fed up, this Milo, and he's going out looking for his dad now too. So... And Milo and Lem both shouldn't be out about the ship at this time because they're approaching the Galactic Barrier, and the Galactic Barrier has a history of messing with people who have a more kind of a, I don't know, psychic mind or whatever, you know? So he's supposed to be knocked out. His son is supposed to be knocked out so they can be safe, but they're both awake during this, and he's trying to make his way to engineering so he can launch his probe and do whatever he needs to do. The whole time you can tell that he is being influenced by this voice coming from inside the Great Barrier. The one that kind of comes in the little interludes and speaks in a Susian manner. And I'm convinced is going to be Zero in the end. It very much reminds me of like an evil Tom Bombadil, too. It's, I, I keep getting that sense as well. Uh, but anyway, Lemfall. Uh, he something happens to him at the end. They don't quite explain what's going on, but he's basically, like, affected very much by the barrier and is becoming, maybe, like, becoming, like, an instrument of the, you know, zero on the other side. Uh, Riker agrees to go ahead with Barclay's plan to approach the Great Barrier and hope that the Enterprise's bioneural gel packs can absorb energy enough to... Uh, survive being in the Great Barrier, and then that would get the Calamarain off their backs for a little bit. And they do that, and it works. You have a little bit of uh, Lady Q and Little Q in this, but not very much at all. They kind of pop in and out to give Riker a little bit of trouble as he's dealing with his situations. But, again, the main point of this story, and the main goal of this, is kind of to show the fall of the Takan Empire, and how basically Q is responsible for that. So now I'm hoping early in the next book here we're gonna find out what the heck how it all uh, how this is all gonna come together. It seems like there's so much that they have to do. Well, we'll see how uh, Mr. Greg Cox puts it all together in the finale here. Uh, so far, it's been a very fun ride, and I uh, enjoyed being on it. So. Uh, we'll continue with the Q strike. Let's see, am I forgetting to tell you anything that I should tell you? I'm just, I'm just, just skimming my notes here, guys. Uh, no, I think I covered it pretty well. Again, it's a story of the fall of the Takan Empire, and uh, 
Uh, some very interesting allusions, too, I guess, uh, that Q makes as far as the, what these other creatures have done, you know, in history and stuff like that, too. So, I don't know, a, a lot of interesting stuff going on there, and I'm happy to have read it, and I'm just dying to get into the next one. So, we're going to do that right now. And uh, as always, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Live long and prosper. And we'll see everybody in the next one.